Well, I just want to thank everyone for coming, um, spending your lunch time with me. Uh, you know, whether you live in Miami-Dade County or the south, uh, the southern portion of the state, or maybe even somewhere in the southeastern United States, um, some of at least some of what I talk about today will be pertinent to your area. Um, a lot of these butterflies we're discussing, um, they are the more common species for Miami-Dade County. There are a couple that I included in there just for fun, so you can learn a little bit. Um, maybe some of the rare, more endangered species. Uh, but today we will be learning how to attract these butterflies to your yard, how to um, identify them against other similar species, um, all kinds of fun things like that. OK, so let's go ahead and get started in that case. So my name is Dalton Goolsby. I'm the supervisor of the Urban Horticulture Program here in Miami-Dade County. Our program mostly deals with Florida-friendly landscaping, which is an awesome program that helps homeowners like yourselves um, assess less of an impact on our fragile South Florida environment by using less water, less uh, pesticides, um, herbicides, and other harmful chemicals in the landscape to maintain um, these beautiful, attractive landscapes. So um, hopefully this talk will empower you to uh, make some better plant choices, better plant selections, because that grass is always going to need way more water, way more fertilizer. Uh, it might need pesticide if you get things like chinch bugs or something like that. It may need um, fungicides if maybe you're overwatering and you're getting fungal issues. So, um, you know, these Florida native plants that many of these butterflies need, um, they, they don't need water, they don't need fertilizer, they don't need pesticide. You know, they've evolved in Florida by themselves without, you know, any kind of outside influence for thousands of years. So the mindset is, why would they need that now, right? So that's why I always advocate for planting Florida native plants. Without invertebrate pollinators like butterflies, bees, flies, things of this nature, um, which will be getting killed by insecticides, basically we as humans can't eat. So basically the story is that if you want, if you're seeing butterflies in your landscape and they're never really staying and you have all these flowers planted, but you just see them kind of coming through, drinking for the nectar and then they're gone. The secret is you don't want to be planting just flowering nectar plants. You also want to plant what is known as their, these butterflies host plants. So basically every species of butterfly has a specific family of plants or maybe even a, a specific plant that they will be laying their eggs on. Um, for instance, if, you, uh, if you've ever heard about monarchs or you know raised monarchs at your house, you should know that monarchs host on all species of milkweeds. So milkweeds would be considered a monarch's host plant. Um, however, these host plants vary among the different kinds of butterflies. So that's one of the things we'll, we will be talking about today. So um, sorry about my little uh, preamble there. We're gonna go ahead and start getting into some butterfly species. All right. So the first family we're going to talk about is swallowtail butterflies, and these are generally large, colorful butterflies with these forked hind wings. They're mostly tropical, and um, their caterpillars have this really interesting little defense mechanism. You can see the horns there on the picture in the bottom right corner. Um, this is a defense mechanism for the caterpillars in this swallowtail family known as an osmaterium, and they can actually produce this from their head and it lets off this really foul stench that basically is um, they're hoping will um, keep all you know hungry predators away from them. It'll prevent them from being eaten and consumed. So um, these are really cool little caterpillars and butterflies all from the from the very beginning, right? Because these caterpillars um, are fun to watch. They're big and colorful, and then they turn into these big, beautiful um, butterflies once they crystallize. So we have a bunch of species here in um, in South Florida, approximately about ten. Um, we're going to talk about the the major ones, but if you want to do some more research uh, on swallowtails, uh, the ones that are not pictured in this in this presentation that you could find in Florida are the spice bush swallowtail, the pipe vine swallowtail, the zebra swallowtail, the Shouse's swallowtail, the Bahamian swallowtail, which is introduced, and the eastern tiger swallowtail, which I've just recently heard from my friend at RER that um, they've been reforesting. A, the, 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 the eastern tiger swallowtail had been seen in Miami in years and years at this point. At least I haven't seen it. Um, however, I have a friend that works um, with RER, and they basically are restoring natural areas by Matheson Hammock and they've been planting their host plant and they've been seeing these butterflies slowly start to return to the area, which is really cool. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. So as I mentioned, these butterflies are all big, showy yellow butterflies with kind of these forked hind wings that, um, they, and they have these extension, extensions on them, which is where they get their name from, swallow tail, because basically um, they have these weird eye spots and color patterns on the hind wings that uh, basically entice a predator to want to take a bite 
off of its hind wings because they're going to think that's the head. And um, basically, the, the survival strategy here is that these butterflies want they're, they're convincing their prey that that's their their head because you know they can have a little piece of their wings bit off and they can still be viable. They can still live. So um, that's kind of a, a strange. It's, it's predicted to be a, um, a kind of strange um, uh, survival mechanic that these butterflies have adapted. And sometimes when you'll see these butterflies flying through your landscape, you will see that por uh, portions of their wings have been bit off. And that's, I guess, what they're what they're meant to do. So the first one we're going to talk about is this black swallowtail. And this swallowtail is pretty easy to recognize because of all the other swallowtails. It's heavily marked. It's got these um, orange kind of eye spots kind of capped with this blue scaling on its hind wing above and below. It's got these intense uh, bands of orange and blue scaling and um, yeah, they're just these big showy butterflies. And if you've if you've experienced with um, home go at home gardening in your landscape, then you might you may or may not have encountered this butterfly or the larvae, because as you can see here, their host plant, basically the plant the plants they will be laying their caterpillars on, are all species of cultivated herbs and vegetables in the carrot family. So these are things like dill, uh, parsley, fennel. Unfortunately, because these caterpillars do lay eggs on, um, you know, species of cultivated herbs. They can be considered a nuisance pest. But like I said, if you if you have a, a large, you know, patch of this, I, I had like six or seven fennel, fennel and dill and I'm um, sorry, parsley and dill plants in my butterfly garden here at work. And, um, you know, the I, I didn't even notice the black swallowtail's presence on them because, um, you know, if you have enough of it, you, you're, you're still going to be getting way, way more. Um, herbs off of these plants, then you're going to be able to eat anyway. You can ask Tony. Um, I, I mean, I think I put like a five pounds of parsley on the table there for people to take home the other day when I finally harvested it. So um, great, great plants to have if you have a garden, you know, these herbs like dill and fennel, and it's an awesome, beautiful butterfly to see pop up in your garden. The giant swallowtail, this is one of my absolute favorite butterflies. They are um, the biggest butterflies in Florida, and also they um, of all the swallowtails, well, besides the shouses, but the shouses swallowtail is extremely endangered. Um, it's the only swallowtail butterfly that has this cream. Well, actually, the Bahamian swallowtail has the cream color, too. But if you're seeing a cream colored butterfly on the underside and it's big and yellow and black on the top side, nine times out of ten, you're probably looking at a giant swallowtail. And this is another one you're highly likely to see in your in your garden or your landscape because so many people have species of of citrus plants and this guy likes to host on citrus family plants um lemon lime grapefruit uh sour orange um kumquat all these kinds of things you can expect to see giant swallowtail larvae on and um it is one of my favorite larvae because when i'm going around doing these classes for kids um i always try and find one because i tell them it's it's the uh the bird poop caterpillar the caterpillar survival strategy is just that it tries to look like a piece of bird poop on on the plants that they that they inhabit so um as you can see there in the top in the top right corner of the screen uh you can see the the final stage of the bird poop caterpillar and um we do have an, a native uh citrus family plant here to florida that's known as the wild lime tree um and if you have wild limes in your landscape it's the preferred larval host meaning they will lay eggs on all species of citrus however the preferred larval host. So if you have these two citrus trees next to each other, nine times out of ten, it will lay eggs on the wild lime, which is our native uh, lime tree. Um, be warned, it has huge thorns and it doesn't produce a lime. So if you're thinking, oh, I love limes, it's not that kind of lime. It is in the same family, but it doesn't produce a fruit. Um, but they are amazing trees. And if you have the space for them, I highly recommend you plant one because you will see these butterflies all over your landscape. The Palamedes swallowtail, um, this one can kind of superfluously look like the black swallowtail at a first glance. Um, however, the, the cool thing about the, the Palamedes swallowtail, which will give you um, an instant cue as to what it is, is you will see um, this kind of parallel streak. You can look in the bottom right hand corner. There's a parallel band there, a yellow band that runs parallel to the butterfly's body. And if you see that on the swallowtail, you know that it is the Palamedes swallowtail. And um, several sources actually say this is the most common swallowtail in Florida. Um, however, I admit that I, I've never really seen one. Um, they, they do they do host if you're if you're an edible if, if you know the swallowtails are cool plants because they they have they host on a lot of edible families of plants. So if you like to cook with bay leaf and maybe you know we can actually grow bay leaves in our landscape here in South Florida. And this butterfly will actually host on species of bay leaf. Um, 
So uh, red bay, swamp bay, silk bay, all these kinds of bay leaf trees, this um, this butterfly will host on. And they have a really creepy looking caterpillar. You can kind of see it has these creepy looking eye spots. Those aren't its real eyes. It's kind of a uh, Honestly, kind of terrifying if you ask me, <laughs> but they're they're cool little butterflies. And um, I, I still personally think for South Florida, the uh, the giant swallowtail is probably more abundant, but um, several sources do claim that it is the Palamedes. And then um, the last swallowtail we're going to talk about today is the Polydomus. This is another one of my favorites. Um, and at, if you look up at the butterfly, you'll see that this one actually it does have some kind of a ribbing and forking at its hind wing, but it actually doesn't have the the extended swallow tail that the rest of this family of butterflies have, which uh, kind of give it its name. So, and it, it's also pretty much unmarked on the underside wing. You see there's a couple red and, and yellow, kind of cream yellow splotches, but for the most part, it's uh, completely black on the underside. And even on the top side, you see it's very underwhelmingly marked compared to the other butterflies in this family, really only having one golden rim along the, the hind wing rim of the of the butterfly. And for this reason, another common name this butterfly sometimes gets is the golden rimmed swallowtail. Um, and these guys, they like to hoax on these really cool uh, species of vines um, known as Dutchman pipe vines. Um, these are be cautious if you if you like the, the look of the flowers. They are beautiful. The flowers can kind of smell like rotting meat because their their pollinator is um, meant to be like flies and gnats and things of that nature. Um, however, like like I mentioned, these butterflies will be laying their eggs on them. I mean, and you can see the caterpillars for this species are uh, intense, right? So we do have a, a native species of of pipe vine called a uh, Aristolochia tomentosa, which is the woolly pipe vine. However, it's more suited for where I'm from, which is central um northern florida it, it will grow in south florida however it will grow very very slowly um so be cautious there are um tropical species of pipe vines that we can plant here in south florida like this one you see here is um the giant dutchman's pipe vine which is actually the one i have selected for my garden because it's basically impossible to find the woolly one unfortunately here in miami i have a friend who has it i'm trying to get seeds from him but like i mentioned it grows very very slowly um <clears throat> so the, the polydomus can lay eggs on this plant, and there's another species of swallowtail I mentioned called the pipe vine, uh, who will also lay species uh, their eggs on species of pipe vine. However, these tropical pipe vines, like the, the giant one you see here, they're actually too toxic for the uh, pipe vine swallowtail, which is a beautiful swallowtail. If you ever go to North Carolina, you will see them in mass numbers, like beautiful iridescent blue butterfly that looks almost a lot like um, the Palamedes, really. Uh, except it just kind of shines blue um, when it hits the sun. It's beautiful. But um, and we can get those in Miami as well. They're a little more uh, uncommon. But um, the the like I mentioned, the larvae will die if they lay if they eat this um, th these species of, of passion flowers. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> so um, we're moving on to another family now, which is the sulfurs and whites. And these are like little tiny yellow, black, and orange butterflies. Um, and they often have these intricate markings that you can see there in the bottom. And what's cool, the, the very prolific species of uh, family of butterfly. Uh, you can see there's about 15 species here in Miami. And uh, what's cool about these butterflies is they're one of the only species or only family of butterflies that uh, exhibits this puddling behavior. So you can see all these butterflies kind of mud puddling and they're actually, instead of sucking nectar from a flower, which some of them will still do, um, they will actually also get nutrients and minerals from um, mud puddles on the ground. So sometimes you can see them hovered around these mud puddles. What's awesome about the, uh, the these this family of butterflies, they have a very um, diverse you know series of host plants that they will host on. And what's interesting about them, and the reason why perhaps they may be so prolific in in, in the landscapes, I'm sure everyone's seen a yellow butterfly flying around at some point, is because many of their host species are actually uh, species of weeds. Um, so things that normally we would consider weeds, these butterflies need them to survive. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll get into it and I'll, I'll show you some examples and maybe it'll give you a different perspective on some of these, some of these weeds that grow in our natural landscape, right? Um, so the first one, that's a per this is a perfect segue. Um, you can see there in the top right, this is the barred yellow, I'm sorry. And the, in the top right corner, you can see its host plant, which is called a joint vetch. And uh, I'm sure you guys have had those stuck to your socks or shoes or pants at one point in time. Those little green seeds that you see there, kind of annoying and something you might want to rip out in your landscape. But now that you know that they actually serve as a host 
for a butterfly here in South Florida, it might convince you to actually, you know, maybe if you can maintain a patch of them where they're not going to get weedy and, you know, unsightly, then I, I highly recommend doing it because you will see these guys laying eggs on these species of weeds and it's really cool to see. Um, so the barred yellow, they actually um, exhibit some um, some seasonal variability, so they can actually be this kind of white color or they can even be a more yellow orange um, in the in the warmer months. Um, so this is a or sorry, in the summer months they will be more whiter and this is this obviously must be a, a summer um, a summer variable or variant barred yellow. Um, but the, the one way you can always tell this butterfly is it has a very it's a small butterfly with a very rapid flight. And as you see its wings fluttering, you'll almost definitely see that that characteristic black bar. And um, another awesome um, uh, host for this plant is another species of weed known as a uh, pencil flower. And these are this is probably another weed you're likely to find growing in your landscape. Um, it's also known as cheesy toes. It's basically this small um, pea flower. It looks like a pea, but it's like this small yellow flower. And I, I, I um, encourage you guys to look it up because I guarantee you if you go in your landscape right now, growing in your grass somewhere or in your bushes somewhere, you will see a species of, um, of one of these plants. Which is why this is a butterfly you're almost guaranteed to see in your landscape, by the way. Uh, cloudless sulfur, I guarantee you everyone's seen this butterfly. Uh, the cloudless sulfur is basically um, uh, this, this undescript yellow butterfly, medium size. Um, sometimes it can almost be more of a lime or like a lime greenish color. Um, but for the most part, these guys will basically be uh, unyellow. I mean, just all yellow with uh, maybe a couple black markings you can see there. And they have amazing caterpillars and they will actually be hosting on different kinds of cinnas, different kinds of pea plants. Um, so, you know, if you like, if you're a fan of flowering trees and shrubs, um, I, 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 re I recommend you look into maybe uh, a species of cinna um, to maybe plant in your in your garden and uh, these guys will will host on that. The partridge pea is an, a Florida native plant that is a great choice um, for these butterflies if you want to have them in your yard. And you can see there when the chrysalis is ready to um, to open up, it'll turn this beautiful pink hue. And actually, I, I just had one of these guys in my garden um, a couple weeks ago, so it was awesome to see the chrysalis for that. Um, and actually the one that I have in my garden that these guys are attracted to is um, was actually the 1996 plant of the year in Florida. It's known as the uh, the desert cinna. So if you want to plant uh, and that's pretty that, that'll really grow almost anywhere in the southeastern United States if you have a sunny location and it's a beautiful tree that kind of grows almost like um, a desert plant. It has this kind of like thin wispy canopy um, and it, it's called the desert cinna is the plant that I have in my garden for this butterfly. Awesome plant. The dainty sulfur, um, this is another one you're almost uh, guaranteed to see growing in your yard, and that's because um, its host plant is something that everyone hates and it's, everyone's run into at some point. You see in the bottom right hand corner there, uh, its host plant is actually Spanish needles, another another um, weedy plant that people are always calling me about how to how to maintain. And I always say, you know, it is it does get very weedy. I won't try and defend that, but you know, if you can maintain a patch of it in your yard, first of all, these yellow and white flowers are loved by bees. So if you're a, you know, save the bee advocate, Spanish needles is one of the best plants you can have in your garden and you can maintain a patch of it. The flowers can be eaten. Um, so if you're not spraying them with anything, you can eat them fresh. You can garnish your gar garnish the salad with them. Um, and you will also most definitely be getting these dainty sulfur caterpillars in your yard. So these dainty sulfurs, um, they have a, they, they look a lot like the uh, the barred yellow, actually, except they have a more intense flare of, of orange you see there between the hind wing and the forewing. And they have a usually a black dot there at the at the base uh, or at the uh, tip of that flare. And that's how you'll recognize those guys. They also have a similar, um, you know, black bar on the inside of the wings, but you'll generally be seeing these guys um, with their wings closed. Um, and then one, another, we're getting to another one of my favorite butterflies, the Great Southern White. And this is, butterfly is so pretty, undescript white butterfly. If you're seeing a female, the female can actually range in color. So it could have almost like a blue gray pattern on the outer on the outer wings. But the one way you can always tell this butterfly apart from others, if maybe the, the white, the plain white butterfly isn't enough for you, they always have these sky blue antenna tips, which are so pretty. Um, and that's the distinctive feature of them. 
um, here in Miami or here in uh, Florida. So uh, no other butterfly will have that the blue sky antenna tip. So really pretty butterflies. And these guys like to lay their eggs in clusters, as you can see. And this is a butterfly I have in my garden. I don't know if any of my Instagram friends are on here listening in right now, but I'm always posting this plant, this, this caterpillar on my story because they are just nonstop in my garden. They host on another kind of weedy plant that is criminally underrated. It's the Virginia pepperweed also known as uh, poor man's pepper. And um, you can see those little circular kind of seed pods and the plants, they actually make this little tiny iridescent red seed. And you can find this plant growing on roadsides, um, semi-aquatic habitats, things like that. It, it, it can actually be harvested and used as a, a black pepper substitute. So for that reason, it's actually known as poor man's pepper as well, because it's cheaper to grow than a pepper plant and cheaper to get. Um, and it's, it grows in excess. I mean, my garden, like a quarter of it is just taken up by the plant just because you really have to know, like after you after you form your butterfly garden, you'll see what plants are doing good, what plants are getting caterpillars and which ones aren't. So um, I try to support the butterflies that I see more um, in excess in my garden. So I have a bunch of this planted because I am always seeing them in my garden. All right, on to the next slide. And now we're getting into gossamer winged butterflies. This is another family of butterflies. The first ones we were looking at were the swallowtails. This is a completely different family of butterflies. They sometimes um, exhibit iridescent wings um, and they have these kind of streaked, uh, spotted, uh, you know, eye marks or, uh, or extensions on their wings. And we'll talk about them first with the hair streaks. And that's where um, the streak like extensions from the wings come in. Um, these are a species of gossamer winged butterfly or a family, a subfamily of gossamer winged butterflies. And um, the first one we're going to talk about is the fulvous hair streak. And this is an introduced butterfly. And I'll give you guys one guess of to where it came from when I show you its, its host plant. Its host plant is called Brazilian pepper. So as you can assume, it's probably from South America, right? Areas like Brazil, where this plant will be native to. Unfortunately, this plant grows way too well in Florida and this plant, uh, especially in South Florida, and it's um, an extremely uh, potent invasive plant and um, we do everything we can to try and remove it. However, it's not all bad because the birds do love the seeds and the fulvous hair streak will actually be laying eggs on, on this species of plant. Ti all these hair streaks are tiny, tiny, tiny little butterflies. If you don't have a, binoc a pair of binoculars or a camera, it's going to be almost impossible to observe one of these guys up close where maybe the swallowtails and the um, the sulfurs might let you get a little close to them. These fulvous hair streaks or these hair streaks, they're 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 definitely not letting you get anywhere near them. So the gray hair streak, um, these guys will also be hosting on partridge pea and other pea flowers. Uh, and you can see um, the, the as the whereas the fulvous hair streak is more brownish, grayish brown color. The uh, the gray hair streak is a is a straight gray color. And a lot of our hair streaks in Miami will look like this. So I just included this one because it's um it's pretty common and it hosts on a couple of the plants that I've already mentioned. So uh, just keep that in mind. There are other hair streaks uh, that we can see in Miami. And if you send me an email after this, I'll sh I'll send you a list of checklist of all the butterflies in Miami that you can expect to see. So then maybe if you see a hair streak, you can narrow it down and know which one it is. And the last hair streak I'm going to talk about is the red banded hair streak. Um, and these guys are really cool because if you have species of mango trees in your yard, these guys actually like to feed on um, dead uh, dead leaf material at the bottom of your tree. So if you ever see um, a gray, a small gray butterfly with this intense red band all the way up the, the outside of the wings, you know it's the red banded hair streak. And um, be careful walking in the leaf litter around your trees because it's probably laid some eggs there um, on the leaf litter. It literally eats dead leaves, kind of cool. Um, one of the only butterflies in South Florida that will do that, if not the only. And now we're getting to my favorite, one of my favorite families of butterflies, the blues. And um, these guys are lightly colored. Uh, if you if you look there, you'll notice um, actually the Atala there is in the bottom left corner. Uh, that's actually not supposed to be there. It's actually a hair streak. Uh, the Atala is a hair streak. Amazing butterfly. I don't talk about them in this talk, but if you want to plant for the Atala, it was once known as an endangered species. Quick, quick little side story just to show you that, um, you know, planting these host these host plants does save butterflies. Um, when the, in the 1970s, when the Endangered Species Act was made, the Atala was not included on the bill because it was literally thought to already be extinct. Uh, fast forward a couple years, um, a, a researcher finds an extant colony of them living in Virginia Key, hosting on the Kunti palm. 
And actually, these guys, uh, it's, it's thought that they will only host on Cootsie Palm, but they will actually host on any species of Zamiaceae family plants. So the Cassius Blue is an awesome little tiny butterfly, and I love these guys because um, you're definitely, if you've definitely seen one of these and you definitely did not take the time to appreciate it because they're these tiny, tiny little butterflies. They just look like little white and blue streaks flying through the air. But if you get the chance to, you know, look up to it close with either a microscope or I mean, um, either a binoculars or a camera lens, you can see they have these ethereal iridescent blue spots on their hind wings and they're capped with, um, with these orange, uh, with this orange scaling. Uh, so very, very bright. Um, beautiful little tiny butterflies, one of my favorites, and we have its host plant planted all over our landscape here. Um, one of its host plants anyway, the, the one that I think is the preferred host plant is the wild tamarind, which you can see there in the bottom right hand corner. It's um, kind of a low to medium sized tree, so um, if you have a small space where you want to have a smaller sized tree, a wild tamarind is a perfect option for that, and they make these beautiful little puff flowers and you will have a cloud of Cassius blue butterflies around these trees. I mean, if, if the sun's setting and I'm still here at the extension office and I'm looking at the tree with the sun setting behind it, you just see, um, you know, the little outlines of these guys just clouding the tree in huge numbers. Beautiful butterfly. The Serranus blue, as you can see, looks almost exactly like the Cassius blue. Um, however, if you take the time to look at it up close, you can see that they really only have one distinct eye spot on them. Um, on the outside hind wing. Uh, you can see that in the top corner. This one has really one distinct eye spot. The other one has two, and it also has more dis dis uh, distinct like bands of, of coloring there, the gray bands you see on the outside wing, um, whereas these guys kind of have more diffuse spots and bands. If you need one more, uh, I guess, characteristic that will help you uh, tell the two apart, the Serranus blue. Also, if you if you won't really see it with its wings open very often, but if you do, it has this one singular black dot on its hind wing um, above. So that's how you can tell that one apart. These guys will actually be hosting on other species of, of uh, partridge pea, other, other pea family plants, um, indigo, species of indigo. So if you're if you've caught on by now, you know that the pea family plants, bean family, Fabaceae, one of the most diverse families of plants. And uh, you can see many of the options they have for butterflies, I mean, for, for Florida, are also double as a host plant for a butterfly. So pea family plants are one of the best plants you can uh, you can plant into your garden, and something awesome about them also is that um, they they fix nitrogen into the into the um, into the ground. So it's almost like a source of of natural fertilizer. Because if you know when you buy fertilizer from the store, nitrogen is the first main ingredient that helps promote plant growth. So if you're planting these nitrogen fixing Fabaceae uh, legume family plants into your garden. It's like a source of natural fertilizer and it's a source of host plants for butterflies. So that's a win, win, win because they're also going to be very beautiful in your landscape. It's going to make your neighbors jealous. <laughs> All right, on to the next one. The Eastern Pygmy Blue. I'm not going to really talk about this too much just because it is a, kind of not a really common butterfly you'll see, but I like to include it because it's the smallest butterfly in Florida. I showed you the biggest. This is the smallest and uh, it has these beautiful uh, black eye spots on the outside hind wing that are kind of capped in this silver color, which I just love silver. So I think this butterfly is amazing. And they're about the size of your pinky fingered nail, which I think is so cool. And they'll host on, um, you might see this butterfly if you're on like a beach dune because they like to host on species of glass warts. They really like to grow in these coastal areas. All right, so we're getting into brushwood butterflies. I'm gonna kind of start to move it along faster, but I am gonna take a little bit of time to talk about our heliconians. The heliconians, translates to the um, translates to long wing. So heliconians, also known as long wings, are um, a very prolific family of butterflies here in Florida as well. This is one of the most considered one of the most beautiful butterflies in the entire world, and it is actually one of my favorite butterflies as well, the Gulf fritillary. Northern persons of the southeastern United States, people are jealous of us because we have this butterfly year round. Other parts of the um, east southeastern United States, they only get them during um, certain seasons. Um, we're lucky enough to have them year round. They can superfluously be con um, confused with a mo with a monarch. More, um, I guess, untrained butterfly observants kind of ask me sometimes, like, what is this a monarch? And it's not. Um, the one way you can tell it apart, the body has these orange and white stripes you can see in the top right corner. And when the butterfly lifts its wings up, there's no confusing it for anything else. It has these 
huge silver spots with almost this pink to orange to brown gradient uh, on the wings. Beautiful butterfly. And um, the Heliconians, they make it really easy on us. The, um, they were gonna, they're gonna basically host on any species of passion flower. Um, besides one, I will say there is one in Florida that will not host on the passion flower, but we'll get to that. And there's all kinds of passion flowers that can grow in Florida. Um, be cautious though, remember what I said about native plants in the beginning of my talk, nine times out of 10, they will prefer to lay their eggs on our Florida native passion flowers. That's um, Passiflora palins, that's Passiflora suberosa, and that's the Maypop passion flower, which is that big showy uh, purple one. All those are natives and they will be preferred larval host. Um, I will say, um, they uh, even, even among the native passion flowers, it seems they prefer to go on the corky stem passion flower more than any other one. So if you have all these passion flowers planted next to each other, Nine times out of 10, those butterflies are going to lay all their eggs on the corky stem. And the corky stem passion flower, I guarantee you, if you have a large shrub in your yard and you go look at the base of that shrub and look up what a, a corky stem passion flower looks like, I'm going to show it to you now. I guarantee you'll find one growing in your grass somewhere. They have these tiny little flat, tiny little white flowers that make this beautiful purple berry that the birds love to eat. So the birds are going to be pooping these out in your shrubs, which is why I guarantee you'll be able to find one somewhere growing in a shrub. Super easy plant to grow. If you consider yourself of having a brown thumb and you can't, uh, I guarantee you, you can grow this plant right here. And it will get um, three or four species of butterflies on it, on this one plant alone. So it's an amazing plant to have, good for birds, good for butterflies, and um, all kinds of things will pollinate it as well and get the nectar. So awesome plant. If you could only have one butterfly plant in your yard, this would be one I would, I would recommend for you. Um, and you can see the caterpillars there. All the caterpillars of the, the long wings kind of look the same. The Gulf fritillary, they have this all orange caterpillar with black, with black spikes, right? So remember that. So that's the Gulf fritillary. Now we're going to get into the Julia heliconian. These guys will also lay eggs on passion flowers. And these are a nondescript um, all orange butterfly underneath the wing. They'll have a little bit of mottled yellow and orange pattern, but for the most part, they're all orange. And what's fun about these guys, if you see one of these kind of hovering around a species of passion flower in your yard and you see up on the wing surface above, you can see it has this black kind of scalloping mark at the tip of the wing. I have it circled there. That tells you it's a female. So if you stay there and watch that butterfly with the black tip, um, hover around your plant, you're almost guaranteed, it's probably hovering on that plant because it wants to lay some eggs. So I guarantee, I, I, I challenge you to stay there and just watch, observe for a minute because you might see it lay some eggs on your plant, which is, if you've never seen a butterfly lay some eggs, it's really, really cool. So the black tips means it's a female. And you can see the caterpillars have the same spikes like the other Heliconian did, except that this one is very crazy color pattern. All right, kind of moving along, the variegated fritillary. Same, and it's also in the long family, but I mentioned that there is one that does not lay uh, eggs on species of passion flower. This is that butterfly. This one, um, and actually most fritillaries will actually be laying eggs on blue violets instead of the passion flower, but the, uh, the gulf fritillary is just kind of a special case where it will lay eggs on either the, pa the, 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 the vine or the, the violet. Um, but it prefers the violet here in Florida. If you go to North Carolina, um, man, they have hundreds of different kinds of violets, it seems like, and there are way more. They have a lot of heliconians, but most of their heliconians in North Carolina are fritillaries, which prefer to lay their eggs on the violet. So anyway, this variegated fritillary will lay eggs on species of blue violet. You can see it there in the bottom. And um, these guys kind of have this um, this camouflage pattern when they lay their wings up. I, I, I've seen maybe a couple of these. I see maybe like two or three a year. So they are here, but compared to the other Heliconians, they're, they're much more rare. But if you, if you do see one, it's really, really special. Um, they're beautiful butterflies. And you can see the caterpillar there is orange with white stripes. Um, so it kind of resembles the, uh, the other fritillary butterfly we've already seen. I mean, caterpillar we've already seen. And then, of course, everyone should know this butterfly. This is our state butterfly of Florida, the zebra heliconian, the zebra longwing. Um, very descript. It really, it's hard to confuse this with another butterfly. But if you need some, I guess, characteristics to help you identify it, um, it's not very long this way from like from the tip of the antenna to the butt. It's not very long, but width-wise, it's extremely long. It has very long, elongated wings with these uh, with a zebra um, pale yellow to white stripe pattern you can see there. And if you even need more than that, they do have these red spots at the base of their wings, and that can be used as your final um, 
observation point, I guess, to help you observe this butterfly. So these guys, like I mentioned, will be laying eggs on all species of passion flower, preferably the corky stem passion flower. And um, if, if you're if you're like want to get into butterflying, this this is a butterfly that will just let you walk right up to it. Like literally, you can just walk right up to these guys. Very graceful flyers. So for that reason, it's a lot of people's favorite butterfly. Um, they're just very friendly, and you can see the caterpillar is all white with the black spots. Um, I mean, I've got some corky stems in my butterfly garden here, and I mean, I must have 30 of them on one plant right now. And another cool thing, I'm just going to quickly direct your attention to the chrysalis in the top left or the you know, the, the left corner there of the, all the images. Um, on the on the left side of it, which is the back side, um, you can see there are actually like silver spots on the chrysalis, which is just so cool. Um, if you know anything about the monarchs, you know the monarchs get a little bit of gold on, on their chrysalis, and the zebras get a little bit of silver on theirs. It's really beautiful. All right, crescents. We're not going to talk about these guys too much, but I am going to mention the Phaon crescent. Um, this is a tiny, tiny little butterfly um, with cream, orange, and black markings. Um, there is another one called the Cuban crescent, which looks a lot like this. So um, if you see one of these in your yard, um, maybe try and find out what what it's hosting on, and then it will help you cue off what it is. But you're most likely seeing the Phaon, and the Phaon crescent hosts on an amazing plant. Probably, I, I mentioned the, the passion flower is one plant you should have in your garden uh, if you just want to have the basics. If you want to have another basic really good plant, it's this one you see here in the bottom right-hand corner. Another weed that I guarantee you, you guys can go out and find in your grass right now when your landscape growing. And it's called uh, turkey tangle. It's called frog fruit. It's called match head. It has all these kinds of crazy names, but um, the scientific name is phyla notiflora. And um, this this stuff can actually grow as a as a grass replacement. So I've actually have a master gardener, and I went to his house recently to verify his yard as a butterfly habitat. And um, he had replaced all the grass in his yard with this phyla notiflora, and he had about a thousand, I'm not even exaggerating, he had about a thousand butterflies flying around his yard because he removed the grass. And guess what? Because he's got that Florida native ground cover, he never waters his grass, he never applies fertilizer, he never applies insecticide, he never applies herbicide, he never applies fungicide. It, his yard is immaculate, and um, it's because he's replaced the grass with his Florida native weed, and it's actually a beautiful plant. It makes it's in the uh, Verbenaceae family, which is uh, lantanas and things like that. So if you look, the flower actually looks like a lantana. I don't know if you guys have species of lantana in your gardens. There's a a native one called lantana depressa that's a great selection for um for a nectar plant. But I encourage you to go into your yard and find a piece of this, find a piece of this match head. And uh, I mentioned it's a ground head cover, so it kind of sprawls out. And you can actually rip this out of the ground, rip a strand of it out of the ground, put it in a pot. I guarantee you it'll grow roots, and then you can begin, you know, transplanting it throughout your yard. Every time you go to, you know, plant one pot, that start to, as it begins to fill out the pot, you can plant it in the landscape and then start another cutting and start another cutting. And eventually you too can replace your grass with this beautiful plant as well. And hey, if you guys don't like working in the landscape, guess what? One more final awesome fact about this plant. You're only going to need to mow your lawn maybe, maybe twice a year at most. So for that fact alone, that's awesome. Okay. And your yard guy is going to tell you, heck no, don't do that because he wants to he wants you to keep paying him to come through and cut, mow and blow your landscape. Right. Um, so we're not going to talk about the ladies. Um, I am going to mention this butterfly here because it's a beautiful butterfly and I've, I've actually been seeing it in our landscape. I, I haven't been able to get a picture yet. Um, I've seen it twice in our landscape in the two years I've been working here, almost three. So a very, very rare butterfly for South Florida, but it is here. And this is the Red Admiral. And I believe it's hosting on a, a another weedy plant known as Florida Pellitory, which is a tiny little, um, very whimsical little little plant. So I I know we have it in our landscape. I've seen it. I haven't seen any caterpillars on it yet, but this butterfly is beautiful. And so are the ladies. I'm going to show you the painted lady quickly. We can also get the um, the American lady here in in Miami, um, as well as uh, oh sorry, I already said the Red Admiral. This is the painted lady. You can see they have this beautiful webbed kind of um, pattern, the, 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 the pattern when they close their wings is so complex and immaculate. It's like webs and camouflage and brilliant, brilliant reds. It's just a very beautiful butterfly. And you can see it actually looks a lot like the Red Admiral there when it has its, its wings open. And um, the, the American lady will only further confuse you because um, it looks a lot like these other two as well. Um, and like I mentioned, um, 
we do have these butterflies here, but they're 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 less common, so I, I'm not going to spend too much time on them. But they they do host they host on a plant that really only a true butterfly nerd would have in their yard, um, and it grows prolifically where I'm from in, in Central Florida, which is the purple thistle. So if you know what a thistle is, it's a very thorny, beautiful flower, but very thorny, and they kind of grow singularly this um this beautiful stalk. So it might not be maybe like the, a flower that only a true butterfly nerd would have in their yard but if you want to get these beautiful butterflies you should plant that in your garden uh buckeyes and peacocks uh I, I don't see too many buckeyes here but the buckeyes will actually be hosting on the on the phaon i mean on the match head as well another butterfly that will host on that one plant so that one plant uh the, the match head the phyla flora, will actually serve as a host for about five different species of butterflies here in South Florida. Let me have the list prepared. Gray hair streak, Phaon crescent, common buckeye, and the white peacock. So four butterflies will all host on this one plant. So um, it's awesome, it's awesome. And the butterflies I was seeing in the Master Gardener's yard, by the way, were white peacocks, which is the next butterfly I'm gonna talk about. Um, one of the only butterflies you'll be seeing with uh, almost like these pink bands on them, and they're very descript. They don't really have anything that looks like them here in South Florida. So if you see a white butterfly with these pink, orange, and brown markings, um, you know it's the, the white peacock. And these guys will be hosting on uh, the, the match head, which you can see there. You can see once it, once it covers an area, it's actually very, very beautiful. Um, more beautiful than I think grass, because it's going to look like grass, but it's going to have those pretty white flowers, white and pink flowers popping up. And it also will host on an aquatic edge plant known as Herb of Grace, which is another beautiful ground cover type plant. So either if you have maybe a spot that always fills up with water and always gets really muddy, Herb of Grace might be a great plant that can manage that water, soak it up and actually provide back for the wildlife in your landscape. So, you know, if you've got a patch of your grass that's always dying because it's just always too wet, hey, maybe you should stop planting grass there and plant an aquatic edge plant that will look beautiful way better than that dying grass and serve a purpose for our local wildlife just a thought and now we're getting into our admirals and relatives um, we do have a couple species of these in in miami uh, it's kind of argued about however many uh, that we actually do have because some people argue that the malachite is not truly in miami um, i would love to see the malachite by the way which is that beautiful green and brown butterfly you see there another introduced species that hosts on um an invasive plant known as green shrimp plant I just included it because it's beautiful. And if you see one, email me because I'm going to be jealous. Um, so really, the only one I'm going to talk about today is the Viceroy. But um, there's also uh, a couple others that you might be able to find here in Miami, like I mentioned, the Malachite and the Red Spotted Purple. But the Viceroy is one that you might see. And uh, when you're looking at this picture, you might be thinking, hey, that looks a lot like a monarch. And that's actually on purpose because the Viceroy has actually mimics the monarch because you may or may not know monarchs have adapted this amazing survival strategy where they basically try to prevent themselves from being eaten by bearing this characteristic orange, black and white pattern that's considered to be a warning pattern to predators. Um, as when monarchs are, are little you know, caterpillars, they're eating species of milkweed plants, and this milkweed is letting off this toxic sap that the um, the caterpillars have actually managed to ingest, and they it gives them this color pattern, and, um, you know, it gives them also this very pungent taste. So it, it might make maybe a bird who eats a caterpillar or a monarch butterfly. It's going to easily remember that color pattern, and it's never, it's going to get really sick from eating that butterfly or caterpillar, and it's never going to want to eat one again because it's going to remember that color pattern. So the Viceroy has actually, interestingly enough, mimicked the, the, the pattern of the monarch um, over years and years of evolution, and it actually looks a lot like the monarch, um, to the untrained eye, that is. Uh, so if, if you know how to look for it, it, it becomes very easy to spot against the monarch. So first of all, the monarch will obviously be laying eggs on species of milkweed. The Viceroy will not be doing that. It'll be laying eggs on willows, like weeping willow, uh, black willows, and things like that. So maybe in swampy areas, or um, weeping willow is a beautiful addition to a, a landscape. My dad used to have them growing in Bellevue. But the way you can tell the monarch apart from the Viceroy, first of all, the Viceroy is much, much smaller. Second of all, um, the, the Viceroy is really pale orange. I know the image doesn't do a good why, a good job of showing it, but the, the Viceroy is a very pale colored orange when it lifts its wings up on the underside, very pale. And the, the most distinctive way you can tell them apart besides the size is these Viceroys 
um, they have a black line that in, that cuts their hind wing in half, and you can see it there on the bottom right. The line is pointing to it there. A monarch will not have that line that cuts that wing in half. It'll just be a straight orange wing with black veins. You can see that the wing still has veins, but it's got that one line that intersects all those veins, and a monarch will not have that. So that's the best way you can tell them apart. And that it has that line above and below. Um, if I've got anyone here listening from like the rest of the southeast eastern United States besides Florida or northern Florida, you're very, very likely to see this butterfly. I actually saw my first one on my most recent trip to North Carolina, and I was like totally geeking out about it. <clears throat> so um, now we're going to get into another family, subfamily of butterflies called wings. Um, and really, we only have uh, maybe one or two uh, species of wings, actually maybe even three. Um, however, one of them is extremely, extremely endangered, and that's the one you're seeing there on the page. And really, it's only found in the, the Everglades, but I guess the Everglades are South Florida, so we can consider it Florida, um, or we can consider it for this talk. But the other ones you'll see are um, the Florida, the Florida purple wing, uh, the dingy purple wing, and uh, also the ruddy dagger wing. So uh, we're going to be looking at that now. So this beautiful butterfly, the ruddy dagger wing, I actually just saw my very first caterpillar for this literally just yesterday, which is a kind of a strange coincidence. I posted it on my Instagram story because I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Beautiful caterpillar. I'll just skip forward so you can see it real quick. And I live in the I live in Coral Gables, which if you've ever been to the Gables, you know it's dominated by these um, immaculate strangler figs. So in theory, I should be able to see this butterfly everywhere. However, I've never actually seen the butterfly flying around. However, a lot of my coworkers have. I'm very jealous, but I have now, as of yesterday, seen the caterpillar. Um, and it was on it wasn't on the strangler fig, but it was on a different a different species of fig we have growing in our landscape. So um, really, any kind of fig, I believe, should do for the ruddy dagger wing. You might want to fact check me on that, um, but it, it will definitely prefer our native figs um, opposed to the, you know, like the edible ones, as is the case with a lot of other butterfly species. Um, so this butterfly, uh, it has these. Uh, as as do all the butterflies in this wing subfamily, they have these dagger-like wings um, with these irregular edges. And uh, the ruddy dagger wing, I, I should have provided a better picture. It's actually orange. Um, it's like an orangey brown color above. Um, so it's very descriptive butterfly, very descriptive. Um, and we're going to skip over the sassers. These, these guys are you, these guys are, you're more likely to see like in a forested area. Unfortunately, Miami-Dade County does not have many forested areas remaining, uh, unfortunately. Um, and then we're going to get into the family called the monarchs, everyone's favorite, right? Um, the most popular butterfly in the North, uh, North America. Um, you know, these butterflies are actually known to migrate. Um, you know, the Day of the Dead, my, um, you know, actually coincides with the butterfly migration um, from Mexico as these butterflies migrate across the, um, the United States. Um, I believe that's the right holiday. I might be wrong. You might want to fact check me on that one too. But like I mentioned, these guys will be hosting on basically any species of milkweed. We do have several native species of milkweed, um, the, the most popular being uh, Asclepius tuberosa. Um, however, this this once again, just like the uh, Aristolochia tomentosa, doesn't really grow too well in Miami. It will grow. I have it growing, but it's really only going to be able to support maybe one caterpillar. So the one I pref the one I, the species of milkweed I really like is known as giant milkweed. It's not necessarily a native, but it's not invasive, and it can support a whole colony of caterpillars as opposed to maybe where our natives can only support one or two. Um, so for that reason, to, for the purpose of food for the butterflies, this is one non-native that I might recommend over our natives, especially for Miami. Um, so obviously the monarch, everyone knows the monarch. Um, you can see there, it does not have that intersecting black line on its hind wing, which lets me know it's a monarch. And you can actually tell if monarchs are a male or female, because if you look in that smaller photo on the bottom right-hand corner, you can see on above the wing surface, uh, the males will have this scent patch, which looks like a black dot on the wing. And uh, it's basically there to attract a mate. You can't really smell it. Um, but a female definitely can, and she will, and that's how she finds her mate. Um, so you, if you see a butterfly and it's got this black dot on its hind wing above, you know it's a male. So fun little thing there. Um, if you, if you, you know, maybe you're not seeing the line, there's a couple other ways you can tell a monarch apart. It'll have almost a, uh, a pale, a pale orange, pale yellowish hind wing. The top wing's really the, uh, the same color as the butterfly is above, but just the, um, the hind wing below will be a little bit lighter color. 
and um, it actually has two lines of two rows of white dots in its wing margin. And if I actually go back, I forgot to mention this is not going to really be something you notice while it's flying, but the Viceroy actually has three lines of dots. Um, so I mentioned the uh, the monarch gets its color pattern from eating that uh, that sap from the milkweed plant. The uh, the the viceroy actually is not poisonous, but it, it's mimicking it. So something can eat the viceroy and be perfectly fine, but if it eats the monarch, it might get a little sick. Um, a lot of people don't know there's actually more butterflies in the monarch family than just the monarch, and uh, one of them is a queen, which we can actually get here in Miami. Beautiful mahogany colored butterfly that looks a lot like a monarch as well. So if you see like a mahogany brown colored monarch esque butterfly, these will also be hosting on species of milkweed, but instead of a, a a queen, it's a. I mean, instead of a, a monarch, it's a queen. And the the monarch, the queen uh, caterpillars also look a lot like the monarch caterpillars as well. Except I'm going to have you guys count the horns on that caterpillar. You'll see a queen caterpillar has three horns, and we're going to go back to the monarch caterpillar right now, and you can see it only has two horns. So if you've got yellow and black caterpillars on your milkweed in your garden, you know it's a monarch if it has two sets of horns. And you know it's a queen if it has three sets of horns. The uh, the color patterns are also a little different, but the easiest way to tell is by the sets of horns. And queens are one of my favorite butterflies. They're very beautiful, underappreciated. And um, actually, our monarchs in, in Miami do not migrate. So they do migrate um, throughout the rest of the United States. But we're lucky enough to have a basically a season round butterfly, a year round butterfly season here. And uh, these monarchs do not migrate. So um, we're running low on time. I'll, I'll kind of keep going. If you guys have to leave, I understand. Feel free to email me for the PDF to miss the slides that we're about to talk about. But really, the only ones we have left to discuss are skippers. And these are butterflies that basically uh, resemble moths. And um, the difference between them and moths is uh, they, they have clubbed antennas or hooked antennas, whereas moths have feather-like antenna. They look like little feathers. And also, their, their wings are not coupled. Whereas a moth's wings are coupled together, which means uh, the forewing and the hindwing cannot separate. So that's why sometimes you'll see a butterfly fanning its wings up and down. A moth cannot do that. And also the final distinguishing factor is moths are active during the nighttime generally, whereas butterflies and skippers are active during the day. So there's two kinds of skippers. Spread wings, which you'll see they'll always have their wings spread out on the plants when they're, um, you know, when they're, uh, nectaring or they're resting on a plant and this is actually our florida endangered uh florida um florida dusky wing so uh, this is another endangered butterfly and it hosts on a plant which is actually pictured there which is known as locust berry beautiful plant if you have a uh, maybe the need for a sun loving shrub a locust berry is a great option because you might be lucky enough to get these butterflies on them and they have beautiful flowers locust berry i, I recommend you guys look it up However, as I mentioned, these are the common species we're likely to see. So for us, uh, other spread wing skippers, you're very, very likely to see a Durantes long tail. I see them almost every day. Um, they have this kind of uh, wing, uh, you know, swallow tail like extinction on their on their spread on their on their hind wing. They're a brown butterfly. There's another one that might um, you might confuse it with. It's known as the long the long tailed skipper. Um, however, the, the way to tell them apart is by the caterpillar. So the, the long tail skipper is in the top right corner. You can see it has a uh, kind of a red head and um, a, a yellow dorsal stripe, whereas the Durante's long tail is less distinct. It doesn't really have that red marking, that scarlet marking on its head. And these guys will also be hosting on all species of legumes. And the one that I see them on almost every every week here in my office is butterfly pea and um, also the, uh, the Dixie tick trefoil, which is that weedy plant I showed you earlier. Let's see if I can quickly find it. This is the Dixie Tick trefoil right there, that plant on the far right side. So if you see that plant and you see a portion of the leaf is is maybe bitten bitten apart and kind of folded over, um, don't don't rip it open because there's probably a caterpillar in there. But sometimes you can look at the leaf through the sides and you can actually see a caterpillar in that leaf. So that's really cool. That's something that the skippers do. They'll actually roll up the leaf um, just like a moth will. So they they don't actually like crystallize like the butterflies will, but um, they will actually almost make like a pseudo cocoon. OK, sorry, getting back to it. Um, another another um, spread wing skipper you're likely to see, especially if you live near the coast, is this mangrove skipper. And this is another distinctive butterfly here in South Florida. They've got they're mostly black or brown, but it, it, 
like I, I love the Chapman Field going out there and kayaking through Chapman Field. And this is a butterfly you will see all over Chapman Field because as you're kayaking out, you know, there's obviously a huge mangrove um, forest right there. And um, the mangrove forest is cool because, you know, it's all shaded with little beams of light shining through the mangroves. And as this butterfly shines through one of those rays of light, you can see it light up with this iridescent blue, which is so amazing to see. And another uh, characteristic feature about it, it has this white face. So if you see a large white face butterfly that's iridescent in the sunlight, you know it's this mangrove skipper. And as the name suggests, this creepy little caterpillar here will be um, hosting on the red mangrove which is prolific all across Miami Dade County. So maybe you're on the boat or in a coastal area, you, you're very likely to see this butterfly. Maybe not in your backyard, unless you know you're, you're you live on like old cutler or something, in which case I'm extremely jealous. Good for you. <laughs> you have won at life. <laughs> all right, so now onto the grass skippers, which is the last uh, subfamily we're gonna be talking about today. And as the name suggests, you know, I, I give a lot of hate to grass, but there are some species of grasses, mostly our native grasses, um, that butterflies will host on. This one you see here in the bottom right corner is known as the least skipper. Um, on the evolutionary chain, uh, this guy is like very, very, very early on for the, for the skipper family. They're, as the name suggests, the least skipper, they basically have the least adaptations for survival, and they are a tiny, tiny little butterfly. Really cute to see. Uh, they almost don't even look like a butterfly. They almost look more like a fly or something like that, the way their body is. Anyway, um, we're going to get into a couple common grass skippers. The clouded skipper is one you're almost definitely going to see. And um, all these skippers, they kind of hold their wings. Like I mentioned, they, um, they their hind wing and their, their forewing are kind of hooked together with these Velcro-like structures. Um, they're not completely... Um, you know, coupled together like a moth would be. But for that reason, because they're hooked together, you, you kind of always see them spreading their wings like this. Um, it looks like the, the hind wing and the forewing are attached, but the, uh, the, uh, the forewing is almost like up a little bit, whereas the hind wing will generally be uh, perpendicular with the ground or parallel with the ground, sorry. And the clouded skipper, they have these three spots, and you can almost even see through the spots. They're um, semi-transparent spots. Unmarked brown butterfly. It has a little bit of iridescence uh, if it's in the light. Um, but if you see those three spots right there that you see in the top right corner or the bottom right corner, you know it's probably the clouded skipper. There are another other um, few other species that might resemble this, like the three-spotted skipper, and um, maybe the uh, maybe the um, the hammock skipper might confuse you for this, but um, it's it's pretty easy to, to recognize and it's it's more common than the other two. And these guys will actually be hosting on St. Augustine grass. So there's a chance if you have St. Augustine grass in your yard, you might be seeing this butterfly, which is why I included it in this talk. Fiery skipper is one of my favorites. And the fiery skipper, I'm actually gonna show you, I'll skip forward a little bit and show you the, the satchum. They look a lot alike. And the, the way you tell these two butterflies apart, because they will actually be hosting on pretty much the same species of grasses as well, is the fiery skipper has these very distinct black dots on the outside of its wing, whereas the satchum will have more um, patches and they're, they're much more diffuse. You almost can't even see them on the side there. Uh, if you look up, you'll see gray patches, whereas the fiery skipper has gray dots. And these guys are all over the southeastern United States. Um, beautiful little butterflies. And uh, with most of the um, the grass skippers, they always almost have this orange rust colored um, rust colored skin. And you can see they also have those clubbed antenna. I mentioned the moths have a feathered antenna. So that's something that allows us to differentiate them from moths as well. Um, and then the last one I believe we're going to talk about today, yep, is the monk skipper. And this one is all over Miami because I mentioned that uh, grass skippers usually host on grasses. This is considered a grass skipper, but actually it hosts on species of palms. As you know, Miami-Dade County is palm heaven. So there are th like hundreds of different species of palms down here. And this guy will be hosting on basically all of them. So I like to call these butterflies thick boys because they're very thick. Uh, unmarked brown butterflies, and um, they are very common in the landscape. So if you see a thick, plain brown butterfly in your landscape, and it's near some palms, it's almost definitely this monk skipper. Um, and uh, you can maybe look for some folded up palm fronds, because you might be able to find this creepy looking caterpillar um, wrapped up in them. So with that, uh, that's basically all I have today. I want to thank you guys all for coming, and I, I hope you learned something. Um, at least maybe learned a couple new host plants that you might not have 
known about, or maybe you learn what a host plant is entirely today, in which case I encourage you to go. You're not going to find these host plants at Home Depot, right? Uh, all these Home Depot plants and, you know, these big box stores, a lot of even their flowering plants that you may think be a good source of nectar, they, they're so heavily modified for a big bloom that some of these plants don't even produce nectar anymore. So with that, I'll give you a kind of tale of caution about going to a Home Depot to buy a nectaring or a host plant because um, it might be so heavily bred that it's no longer producing nectar. And um, so for that reason, I always recommend planting Florida native plants. Uh, you guys can email me for these slides in a PDF version if you want to kind of recap the host plants and some of the butterflies and distinctive features. Um, and if you're interested in butterfly gardening, um, please shoot me an email and I'll follow up with some uh, some resources for you that tell you um, local nurseries where you can buy local plants. Um, I'll send you some some uh, literature, which is provided by uh, Bound Bound by Beauty, which is this awesome program, which is trying to bring um, you know uh, bring recognition to some of these weedy, underappreciated weedy plants that actually serve as hosts for butterflies. Um, so if you guys uh, want to shoot me an email, um, you know, I'm here all day and I'll be more than happy to follow up with the slides for you um, with, uh, with whatever information you're looking at. Um, so please follow up. And uh, just one last little thing. Uh, on November 19th, I will be doing this talk live um, at the Elaine Gordon Enchanted Forest, which has an amazing immaculate butterfly garden and all kinds of butterfly species there. And I will be doing a guided butterfly tour. Um, so I'm gonna be kind of talking and walking. It's not gonna be like a PowerPoint like this was. Um, it's You can find the link on our Eventbrite. However, I believe the the uh, the event is full, but if you just show up November 19th um, at the Elaine Gordon Enchanted Forest, we're gonna be walking and catching butterflies and observing them up close with my butterfly kit. Um, I don't recommend you guys go around catching butterflies yourself. I consider myself, you know, a little bit of an expert and I can do it without harming the butterfly. Um, so, yeah, but that's a nice way to kind of, I guess, tie all this together. You get to see the butterflies firsthand. You get to see how I'm identifying them. And you, you of course, get to see my beautiful face and my passion for, uh, for you know, for butterflies and all this kind of stuff. So November 19th, which I believe is a Saturday at the Elaine Gordon Enchanted Forest. You can find information about it on our Eventbrite, or you can just go to Eventbrite and look up um, butterflies in your backyard in Miami, and it should pop up. Um, so that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, once again, thank you all for coming. Uh, let's see if there's some Q&As up here real quick. Yes, yeah, so I got a question about the plant list and the presentation. Yeah, I would be more than happy to um, to send that information to you. So uh, if you guys want to, um, you know, send me those links, or send send me an email. Uh, I believe Tony posted my email there uh, in the in the chat. You can copy and paste that and send me an email, and I will be more than happy to send you the the PDF of this talk and uh, the plant list, as well as the butterfly checklist our local nursery list, all, all the resources. I'll send them all to you um, because I'm just that kind of guy. <laughs> all right. And I think that's the only question, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Let me see. Yeah, my email address. Awesome. So yes, Tony has posted my email in the chat there. Uh, once again, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned a lot. If you ever want to review this, I will be posting, like I said, on our YouTube channel as well. I don't know if it will be this exact recording, but um, if I need to re redo this talk, I'll do it and get a little more in depth. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to look that up or possibly even maybe send it to some of your some of your neighbors, coworkers, things like that, and get them in on the uh, the butterfly you know, the butterfly kick as well. You know, we can only do so much by ourselves and it takes an army to enact real change. But you know, if if all of us plant one plant, uh, you know, there's there's 10 of us in the meeting right now. If all of us plant one butterfly plant in our landscape, that's 12 more butterfly plants that have been, you know, that, are, that have been brought into this world. And, you know, one butterfly plant could have a whole colony of, of caterpillars on it. So you're just, just the 10 of us, just the 12 of us can, you know, make a make a larger difference than just one of us alone could. So it's really about getting others in on this as well. Um, so thank you all for for your attention and uh, for your passion to, you know, sit here with me and have your lunch over the last hour. And uh, yeah, thank you again for coming. That's basically all I have. I'll stick around for a few more minutes if y'all have more questions, but that's all I have for you today.
Well, it looks like that's all the questions. Um, thank you guys all for coming. Uh, like I said, I hope you learned something and I hope your passion for butterflies has grown a little bit, just like mine has since I've started working here. And um, I mean, it's really, it's really, the, this is the tip of the tip of the spear, right? Um, it, this is just to get you guys excited about it. And I hope I've intrigued you enough to want to do your own research and maybe start your own garden at the house because I can go into my butterfly garden here at the work, which is, which is really only like five feet wide by maybe 10 feet long. And I, I can sit out there weeding and in the five minutes it takes me to weed, I can count like 50 different butterflies that come to the garden, uh, maybe like six, seven different species in five minutes of butterflies. I've got orange barred sulfurs. I've got uh, cloudless sulfurs. I've got all the long wings. I've got uh, the great southern white, the white peacock. I sometimes get swallowtails in my garden. I get monarchs. I get queens. That's 10 already. Um, and that's not even all of them. So just in five. Oh, and now I've got Atalas too, because I, I just got Kuntis and um, I went out and got a, a colony of Atalas from uh, one of our one of our master gardeners here. The Kuntis were getting eaten up by Atalas, so I went and picked some up from their house and uh, started our own colony here. So I've got about 12 at least species, just I like counted off the top of my head in my garden, and I can see them all in about five minutes of sitting out there. So um, they're very easy to attract if you have the plants to do so and the knowledge to do so. So hopefully today I gave you all the knowledge. That's all I have. We're about 15 minutes over, so I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. But um, once again, thank you all, and I hope to hear from you um, and follow up with some resources. Bye, guys.